Hello! Today we will explore the related topics of the origins of agriculture and crop domestication. The background to this slide are some Guatemalan dry beans. By the end of this lecture, you'll understand the processes that led to the cultivation of crops such as beans and how these processes continue to be important to food systems today. We'll begin today's lecture with the family of the week. Then we'll look at the origins of agriculture, followed by crop domestication, as well as the relevance of crop evolution to food systems today. Our family of the week this week is the Poaceae, or grass family. Different plants from this family have been domesticated around the world resulting in the grains that are central to so many diets. These include, for example, wheat, as shown in the photo below, barley, Asian rice, which is the rice many of you likely think of when you think of rice, millets, of which there are many species, sorghum, used both as a grain and for sugar, Teff, the smallest domesticated grain and used to make injera, an Ethiopian flatbread. African rice, a different species of rice, which we'll discuss in greater detail later in the course. Maize or corn. And wild rice, which is a different genus entirely from the other two rice species and is not considered fully domesticated. Their geographic origins include Southwest Asia, including what you might have heard called the Fertile Crescent, South and East Asia, Africa, Mesoamerica, and North America, which is used in this field to refer to North America, north of Mexico. This is a huge family with approximately 650 genera and 10,000 species, and of course, includes many other ethnobotanically significant plants other than grain crops, like sugar cane, bamboo, and sweetgrass, to name a tiny few. Some key characteristic of characteristics of grasses are their hollow stems and fibrous root systems. Also, their flowers are wind pollinated, so they do not need to be showy to attract pollinators. And they produce a special type of fruit called a grain. Let's take a closer look at typical grass flat family flowers and fruits. You'll see that grasses have their own entire vocabulary. And this diagram includes just a snippet of grass specific words. On the top right is a photo of a wheat inflorescence, or group of flowers. And the drawing breaks down the parts into an easier to read cartoon form. The flowers, as you see here, generally occur in groups called spikes or spikelets, which I've circled on both the photo and the cartoon. Inside the spikelets are small flowers called florets, again circled on both images. Many grasses have florets with pollen-bearing and ovule-bearing organs, as you see here, with anthers circled on the cartoon and the small yellow structures in the photo, and a stigma, which, although not shown, sits on a style which goes down to an ovary with a single ovule. And then each of these florets, when fertilized, becomes a small one seeded fruit called a grain. When we eat whole grains, like brown rice, we are eating the entire fruit, including mature ovary and seed tissue. When we eat refined grains, like white rice, the ovary tissue and outer seed layers are removed. 
Because grains are so important throughout the world, their processes of domestication have received great research attention, as you've noticed from the readings. As you saw in the popped secret video, maize or corn is an exception to the flower structure of most grasses in that its pollen bearing and ovule bearing flowers are separated on the plant. The photos on the left show pollen bearing flowers on the tassel at the top of a corn plant, as well as a close up on a single pollen bearing flower with the anthers visible. The photos on the right show the ovule bearing flowers or corn silks. Pollen lands at the tip of a corn silk or stigma, travels down the long style, and fertilizes the ovule in the ovary below. So each corn kernel is a single, genetically distinct fruit or grain. I think the photo at the bottom right helps to show this idea. Because there are few kernels on this cob, it means that only a few female flowers or ovule bearing flowers were successfully pollinated. Now, moving on to the origins of agriculture, let's first ask the question, when and where in the course of our 200,000 year history as a species did agriculture originate? The Balter article describes how different lines of evidence have upended some early assumptions about the origins of agriculture. For example, he describes that agriculture originated independently in multiple centers of origin, and that there is evidence for agriculture in some of these centers earlier than previously thought. I assigned the Balter article because it is an accessible introduction to this subject, but more recent research does tweak his date somewhat. Let's take a look at this figure in a, from an article by Larson et al. On the next slide, on the next slide, I include the entire caption to the figure if you'd like to take a look on your own. But for now, I'll describe the highlights. All of the regions outlined in black are considered centers of independent domestication or centers of origin. You can see that the green regions are those with the earliest evidence for domestication during the early Holocene or 12,000 to 8,200 years ago. And the purple regions are those with later evidence for domestication during the Middle Holocene, or 8,200 to 4,000 years ago. One amazing thing to notice here, which Balter discusses in detail, is that there is evidence for domestication in the Americas during the early Holocene. Now keep in mind that humans did not spread through the Americas until approximately 13,000 years ago. So people in the Americas were interacting with the plants there for a relatively much shorter time before domesticating them than the people in Europe, Asia, and Africa, where people had been living for tens of thousands of years before domesticating the plants in their environment. Now, take note of the letters in the black boxes. These regions correspond to the next figure I'm about to show you. So the other deviation from previous assumptions that Balter describes is that rather than a rapid process occurring over tens to hundreds of years, domestication was a long and winding road in many cases, lasting thousands of years. This second figure from Larson et al. does a good job of showing that. Again, the fully captioned figure follows 
if you'd like to take a look on your own. Here, you can see the letters from the previous figure, each corresponding to a region where agriculture originated. Under each region, they list some key plants and animals that were domesticated there. For example, wheat and lentils in Southwest Asia, banana in New Guinea, cow pea, also known as black-eyed pea in Africa, and peanuts in South America. And the numbers at the top indicate thousands of years before present. For each domesticate, we can see how long and winding the road likely was. The gray dashed lines represent exploitation of the plant or animal before domestication. The blue dashed lines represent management or pre-domestication during which the plant or animal remained unchanged. And the orange bars show the period during which the plant or animal did undergo the morphological changes associated with domestication. When you see a short solid orange bar, this indicates the latest time by which that plant or animal was domesticated. So let's take a look at wheat, the first domesticate listed. You can see that as far back as 12,000 years ago, people in Southwest Asia were utilizing wheat in some way. And shortly before 11,000 years ago, they began actively managing it. Then, over the course of 2,000 years, the process of domestication occurred until 9,000 years ago when wheat was considered fully domesticated. This figure, as well as the map on page 1833 of the Balter article, are good summaries of the major plants and animals associated with each center of origin. We'll come back to these later in the course when we discuss how these plants and animals moved throughout the world to create the food systems we know today and what that means for food sovereignty. The other question Balter explores in his article is why did humans separately and in parallel around the world develop agriculture to begin with? He offers a few plausible explanations. First, it may have had something to do with changes in climate between the Pleistocene and Holocene periods, during which the last ice age ended and a warmer, wetter, and more stable climate followed. Humans may have been motivated to develop agriculture by food shortages related to the unfavorable climate at the end of the Pleistocene and or the more favorable climate during the start of the Holocene period may have been a necessary condition for agriculture. He also mentions that social changes, including the rise of religious symbolism and changes in human nature relationships may have been at play. The explanations continue to be debated, including the degree to which a single explanation or suite of explanations applies universally across centers of origin or whether agriculture developed in each location for distinct reasons. Another explanation, offered by the well-known journalist Michael Pollan, looks at the origins of agriculture not as something entirely driven by and beneficial to humans, but rather he takes the perspective that domestication is a co-evolutionary process that benefits both humans, and domesticates. Domesticated plants and animals, in a sense, co-opt humans to care for them, propagate them, and protect their populations, an evolutionary win. If you're interested in learning more about this perspective, I recommend Pollen's book, Botany of Desire, as well as many of his other writings and presentations. Now we'll turn our attention to domestication. 
Although I've been referring to domestication a lot up to this point, we'll now turn our attention directly to this process. There are a range of opinions for precisely which aspects of crop evolution constitute domestication, and we'll revisit this when discussing the article by Bayonne and colleagues. But here, let's start with this definition of domestication, which I'm quoting from a chapter by Gepps and Papa, cited at the bottom of this slide. They write that domestication is a genetic selection process exerted by humans to adapt wild plants and animals to cultivation and herding, respectively. You can think of domestication as a form of evolution that is largely driven by artificial selection or human selection rather than through natural selection. As a reminder, since I know we're all coming at this with different backgrounds in biology, Evolution through any type of selection occurs like this. To begin with, there must be some level of heritable variation in a population. Then, the population is subject to a selective pressure, and only the subset with the highest level of resistance, or the subset that is most fit, survives. These individuals then reproduce and pass their traits on to the next generation. And the genetic and corresponding physical and physiological makeup of the final population is changed. In the case of evolution through natural selection, the selective pressure might be, for example, a predator, and the individuals who can best resist the predator survive. In the case of evolution through artificial selection, like domestication, the selective pressure might be which seeds farmers harvest and therefore plant the next generation. These selective pressures driving domestication can be conscious, as in farmers saving seeds from the best looking plants, or they can be unconscious, as in farmers inadvertently saving seeds from the plants that retain their seeds. We'll get back to this in a moment. I think a nice visual example for understanding domestication is looking at the change from wild wolves to dogs. Take a minute to look at these pictures and think about the selective pressures resulting in dog domestication, including the traits that may have been selected for to result in the domesticated dogs we know today. As a plant example, let's look at tomatoes. The photos on the left are wild tomato relatives growing in South America, with fruits the size of peas. And on the right are domesticated tomatoes. Again, take a moment to consider the selective pressures and resulting traits associated with this domestication example. Also notice, that although domestication is associated with a decrease in genetic diversity in domesticates as compared to their wild relatives, as you saw in the cartoon a few slides ago and as represented by the colored dots here, breeding can lead to an explosion in phenotypic diversity or diversity of expressed traits, as you saw with the different dog breeds and with these heirloom tomatoes of different colors, shapes, and flavors. We'll come back to this concept when we discuss agrobiodiversity conservation. An important concept in domestication is the domestication syndrome. This refers to the collection of traits that tend to occur in domesticated organisms as a result of the selective pressures inherent to cultivation and human consumption. We'll take a look at some of the most salient of these traits in crop plants. The first of these traits is loss of natural seed dispersal. Many wild plants have fruits that naturally shatter and project their seeds in the process. 
When seeds do not naturally disperse in this way, farmers are able to harvest the plant, harvest and plant them the next season. In the process of domestication, the seeds of plants whose fruits had shattered would not be harvested by farmers and therefore not selected for the next generation or planting season. The week's wheat spike here on the left, oops. The wheat spike here on the left um, is wild wheat with grains dispersing naturally due to their connections to the plant becoming brittle. The spike right here on the right is domesticated wheat with all its grains remaining on the plant. Pictured also is the type of sickle very early farmers would have used to harvest grain, resulting in the selective pressure for domesticated grains not to disperse their fruits naturally. A second piece to the domestication syndrome is uniform germination and flowering. And the photo is of a field of tarwe, which is a domesticated lupine bean from the Andes in South America. You can see how beautiful it is when all of the tarwe plants flower at once. Take a moment to think why staggered germination and flowering might be advantageous in a natural environment but not in a farm or garden environment. A third characteristic is loss of seed dormancy. Seeds from many wild plants remain dormant for many seasons or years until triggered to germinate. One extreme example is the lotus, shown here whose seeds can remain viable after hundreds or even a thousand years of dormancy. However, planting crops often occurs on annual cycles, so the need for seeds to germinate each year is essential. Fourth, in domesticated plants, more biomass is diverted to the usable plant parts. For example, their shoot systems, stems and leaves, are often reduced to a more compact growth form with less branching or climbing. And their reproductive structures are often larger than those of their wild relatives, with larger flowers, fruits, and more seeds. You saw in detail in the popped secret video how Teosinte, the ancestor of maize, exhibits a highly branched growth form and tiny fruits as compared to maize's more compact growth form and many times larger fruits. A fifth trait is reduced plant defenses, both physical and chemical. Physical defenses in wild plants might include spines, hairs, or thick shells around seeds. And chemical defenses could include compounds that are bitter or toxic to humans but that protect plants in their natural environments. For example, wild relatives of cassava, also known as manioc or yucca, pictured on the right, have toxic compounds called cyanogenic glycosides that are absent in many varieties of cultivated cassava today. And wild almonds are toxic due to high levels of the bitter compound amygdalin, while most domestic almonds are not. And last, related to that explosion of phenotypic diversity you saw with the tomatoes and dogs, the domestication syndrome also accounts for plants' adaptations to human uses and tastes. As you saw in the bean photo on the title slide, cultural, cultural pressures may select for variation within crop species to account for culinary, religious, and aesthetic preferences. For example, some of these beans may have different textures, uses in different recipes, different cooking times, etc. While domestication often describes the process of a wild species that is selected for certain features and becomes a single crop, Sometimes a wild species may be selected for 
a different for different sets of features and therefore is domesticated into different crops. One example is Brassica oleracea. From one wild species, pictured in the center, through domestication and subsequent breeding, we now have many crops, including cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, romanesco, collards, kohlrabi, and Brussels sprouts. Now we'll look at how these concepts impact food systems today through the case study of maize in Mexico. I asked you to read the Bayonne et al. article, even though I anticipate that some of the methods and analyses may have at times been difficult to fully understand. In an interdisciplinary field like ethnobotany and many others, it's important to be able to read academic articles outside of your area of expertise and understand the main points. So I'll highlight some of these here, and if you struggled with the article before this lecture, I recommend returning to it at the end and rereading the discussion to see if the pieces come together more clearly. To give some context to this case study, Bayon and colleagues conducted their research in Mexico, a center of agriculture, a center of origin of agriculture, and the site of domestication for maize. As I have alluded to before, the regions where crops were domesticated often hold the highest levels of diversity among varieties of those crops, and the crops hold deep cultural significance for the people in these regions. This is certainly the case for maize in Mexico, where, as Bayon and colleagues write, campesinos are heirs to and trustees of the largest genetic diversity of maize in the world. By campesino here, they're referring to smallholder farmers or farmers that produce their crops at least partially for self-consumption, who rely mostly on family labor and who plant mostly native varieties. Their primary research questions are, one, how do Mexican campesinos contribute to maize evolution? And two, how do Mexican campesinos contribute to the national maize supply? They're asking these questions in part to challenge the common perception that Mexican campesinos are and I quote from the article, unproductive, anachronistic, and a hindrance to Mexican agriculture. In other words, a group of people predicted to disappear over the course of perceived modernization. We'll focus on the first question here as it's most relevant to this week's topic. They analyze national data sets to better understand the conditions under which Mexican campesinos produce maize, as well as how the diversity of their native varieties and agricultural methods impact the crop's evolution. First, regarding conditions under which maize is produced, let's take a look at figure two. Remember, they assigned municipalities to different yield classes, which denote the amount of corn harvested per hectare per year. They determined that the lowest three yield classes marked with asterisks on this figure, let's see, here and here, are, the, are those that mostly represent campesino agriculture. Here, they look at how diverse the environments of different types of farms are. They looked at temperature, altitude, precipitation, and slope. And you can see that municipalities of the lowest yield classes, or primarily campesino farms, represent a far wider spread for each of the four variables than do municipalities of higher yield classes. Bayonne and colleagues use this and other findings to conclude that Mexican campesinos grow maize in a wide range of environments. We'll get back to this in a moment to show why it's important for ongoing maize evolution. 
They applied population genetics to national statistics and knowledge about Mexican campesino agriculture to infer how much genetic diversity is lost each generation, as well as how much is created due to new spontaneous genetic mutations. They found that first, a relatively small amount of genetic diversity is lost from one season to the next. This is due, in part, to the fact that native land races of maize reproduce through open pollination, meaning that different varieties or genetically different individuals come together to reproduce naturally. And this results in seeds for the next generation that may be genetically different than their parents. In addition, this relatively small loss of genetic diversity is influenced by Mexican campesinos seed saving techniques. Because there are many different people in many different environments selecting seeds based on different criteria, a wider variety of seed is saved across the country than would be if all seed was selected by the same types of people in the same types of places based on the same criteria. So this is an example of how cultural diversity and genetic diversity support one another. Relatedly, they found that there is a relatively high likelihood that new genetic diversity is created each season through genetic mutations. This is because Mexican campesinos are growing lots of maize. So if genetic mutations occur at a baseline rate, multiplying that rate by a lot of maize would result in a large estimated number of new mutations. Let's return to the figure from earlier about evolution through selection to understand why all of this is important to ongoing maize evolution. First, looking at the genetic diversity initially present, this is especially high in Mexican campesino maize agriculture due to the many traditional varieties planted for environmental, culinary, cultural, and other reasons. In addition, the authors show how this increases due to open pollination and high numbers of new mutations. They also show that there is great variation in selection pressures because campesinos are growing maize in a wide range of environments and selecting seeds based on many different criteria. Together, these are the ingredients necessary for maize to adapt over generations to a changing climate, new environments, and whatever other unpredictable challenges humans will face. This is why Bayon and colleagues say that Mexican campesinos are providing an EVO-system service, playing with the term ecosystem service, which you read about earlier in the course. Now, I want to zoom out and call attention to the title of the paper. Bayon and colleagues refer to the processes we just discussed as ongoing maize domestication. Given Gept's and Papa's definition of domestication, the genetic selection process exerted by the genetic selection process exerted by humans to adapt wild plants and animals to cultivation and herding, respectively. Take a moment to consider whether, based on this definition, you would consider Mexican campesinos to be domesticating maize. In my opinion, Bayon and colleagues are not describing domestication because this is not about Mexican campesinos exerting selection pressure on wild plants like teosinte. Rather, their farming systems support continued evolution of already domesticated maize. This in no way undermines the essential EVO system service Mexican campesinos are providing to humanity. 
whether through crop evolution during domestication or after domestication, farmers throughout history and today have driven and continue to drive the remarkable changes to plant populations that form the basis of our food supply. And that concludes our lecture on the origins of agriculture and crop domestication. Thanks for joining me.